it's my great honour to welcome you all. It is a very prestigious award. It means the world to me. They have great senses of humour. I like to reveal parts of history to them for. I love making history come alive. They are some of the best people that you can come across. To help them open their hearts. I always come back to this quote. How can we be role models to learners if we're not learners ourselves? It's quite useful to get out of our bubbles, not our COVID ones, and sort of see what else is out there. By sharing best practice, we can see the whole picture. We can see what really matters. Around. It's easy to forget how much has to happen behind the front lines. As a global schools group, Cognita educates over 55,000 students across 12 countries. We're proud to be wellbeing partner at this year's Festival of Education and we want to share the work that we're doing to prioritise children's well-being. This starts with a clear understanding of what well-being is. We looked at the evidence and created a simple Be Well Charter that everyone can use day to day. It gives a clear definition of well-being and then focuses on the specific contributors that influence it. Discover our full Be Well Charter video and other resources to use with your students and families at cognita.com. I really try to not look at myself as just a science teacher. I feel like as a teacher, it's, it's very important to help students grow and develop outside of your lessons. A single teacher believing in you and really believing in you. One teacher doing that can have a large impact, but if you have one or two or three all telling you that and really, really believing in it, it makes you feel like you can achieve anything in the world, honestly. Welcome to this Festival of Education keynote session, part of the annual Festival of Education, taking place online from the 16th to the 30th of June. This year's festival is free for all teachers and educationalists across education in the UK and beyond. This has only been possible thanks to the support of our incredible partners. A huge thank you to our headline partner, Pearson. Our festival partners, BBC Bite Size, Cognita and Teach First. Our literary festival partner, Bloomsbury Publishing, and our organising partner, Wellington College, the home of the Festival of Education.
We'd also like to thank our incredible speakers. Over 200 leading educationalists and thought leaders will be providing sessions at this year's festival. On behalf of the audience and organisers, thank you. It's time to sit back and get set for our upcoming keynote session. If you wish to ask a question during this session, please head over to our Slido page to submit questions and vote for your favourites. Enjoy this Festival of Education keynote session. Good afternoon, Festival. I'm Shane Mann and I'm the Festival Director. Welcome to our final keynote of today, day nine of this year's festival. It's been a long one. It's my privilege this afternoon to introduce a familiar face to the festival and a dear former colleague of mine. Laura McInerney is the former editor of Schools Week and she co-founded, she is now co-founder and CEO of Teacher Tap, a daily survey app of more than 8,000 teachers. Previously, she was a secondary school teacher before becoming a guardian education columnist and then she moved into the world of journalism after being taken to court by the Department for Education because she asked to see some documents. And thankfully, she got them in the end. First of all, please welcome Laura McInerney. Thanks very much, Shane. And thanks for having me here, obviously. Um, yeah, we've worked together for many years and it's always uh, really exciting to be back at Education Festival, which I've done for years and years and years, including for Schools Week and for Teacher Tap as well. And so thank you to everybody who's tuning in at home too. What we're going to be talking about today is really the last 18 months. And frankly, I know we've probably raked over it a lot uh, in the time that we've all been living through the pandemic, but sometimes as you go through things, you don't have an overview of what's happening. You just live through it. And as we're getting hopefully more towards the end and perhaps back towards normality, this is a good moment to just look back a little bit about what happened over the past 18 months. Is there any sense that we can make from it? And what might be the most important lessons for us to think about as we go into the next few years. I'm gonna share my screen here and I've got uh, some slides I'm gonna put up. Um, the talk's called What 8,000 Teachers Told Us About the Pandemic because that's where a lot of the information today is going to be coming from. As Shane said, I was previously the editor of Schools Week and that came about after I was a teacher for six years I taught in East London comprehensive schools, absolutely loved teaching. I thought I would do it forever. Um, I took a, a, what I thought was a small breakout to go and do some studying. And then I asked to see some documents. This was back in 2012. In 2014, I then found myself taken to court for the first time because the Department for Education said that the request was vexatious. And it did take until 2016 before the department in the end gave the documents over, but that picture there is of me victoriously holding on to them. They were the Pentagon Papers. These were just some documents that were sent to people who'd applied for free schools to tell them whether or not they'd got accepted and the reasons why. If you have open planning permission to put a conservatory on your house, it sort of made sense to me that you would be able to get this for schools. And in the end, what we learned was the early free schools, it was a little bit uh, messy in terms of process, but you know, I don't think it was anything that we didn't really know. As it happened, though, it meant I transitioned to becoming a journalist and working for Schools Week. Now, while I was doing that job, we would often be writing front page stories, editorials and trying to put forward teachers' points of view. And it's so difficult to know what teachers think. We spend about £30 billion a year on education, yet it can be really hard to find out what the profession think because teachers aren't sat at desks all day long on computers. They aren't on their phones most of the day. So how could I, as the editor of Schools Week, say teachers think X about a policy? Well, I couldn't. And that's why in 2017, uh, myself and Professor Becky Allen created something called Teacher Tap. So as the co-founder and now spend my time working on Teacher Tap, that's tap with two Ps because it's the app that you tap. How does it work? Well, it's a daily survey tool. Any teacher can be on it. So do please go to the app store, download it. It's free. It's very quick and easy to sign up. And what we ask of you is that each day you're going to ping on your phone and then we'll ask you three, usually three questions. Uh, we can ask, for example, as we did the other day, do you ask for consent before sharing a student's work with the class as we were trying to find out, is that something that's changed in schools? But we might also ask you where you ate your lunch. How did you get to school? What time did you get up this morning? What time did you go to sleep? All in the interests of finding out 
how teachers work, what's driving them in their work, and sharing this data back with you and with people who are improving education and trying to improve teacher retention. The way we share the information back with you, if you're on TeachTap, is that we share the results with you. So the next day you get to see the results. And that's really useful because you can see what's going on in other schools around the country. In fact, just before the lockdown last year, I'd gone to one school to talk about Teach Tap and some of the results. And a lady ran up to me and she said, we love Teach Tap. You could change things in our staff room. And I thought maybe she was going to talk about kind of CPD, the little daily reads that we share. In fact, in their school, the head teacher had said that they could not provide free tea and coffee in the staff room because under regulations around taxpayers' money, it was something that the school wasn't allowed to do. As it happened, we'd asked a question about whether or not you get free tea and coffee in your staff room. And over half of schools had said that they did. So, of course, this teacher had then taken her teacher tap into school and she had said to everybody you know look if other schools are getting free tea and coffee then it can't be true that our taxes can't be used for this and so they had secured free tea and coffee if you were the head teacher in that situation i apologize it might have been a little strange to have somebody rock in with teach tap on their phone but it is why we encourage as many people as possible school leaders middle leaders those of you who are teaching assistants anybody who works in a school do sign up to teach tap if you're not a teacher, you can be on there. You just tick the not a teacher button. We we'll take your results out, but you'll still get to see the daily results as well. We also once a week do a free roundup. And that's because over time, as we're able to analyze more and more information, we are able to work out more and more about what's going on in schools. And that's meaning that we can figure out things very quickly. For instance, when Gavin Williamson, the education secretary the other week, said that lots of schools were closing at 2.45 p.m. and he wanted to stop that, we were very quickly able to find out that a tiny percentage of primary schools, only around 18% of secondary schools closed before three o'clock, but also that we can see about 8% of secondary schools open before 8.30 and quite a substantial minority now in that sort of same range have really, really short lunch hours. So it's not as if kids are being stiffed on lesson time and we could get that information in 24 hours we could analyze which parts of the country, which different types of schools, did it matter more in areas of deprivation or in areas of affluence? We were able to get that very quickly because we have this database of information and because teachers every day give us on average 52 seconds to answer the questions and make sure that we have information. Now, what this meant during the pandemic was something particularly special because Many researchers found that their projects all fell apart when schools were put in the position that most of their children had to stay at home last year. And because of that, it was hard to be able to survey or find out what was happening in schools. You couldn't send people to look. People weren't at you know, their usual computers. Because we were on teachers' phones, we were able to carry on asking questions. And so over the next 45 minutes, I'll be talking about what we learned. Before we get to that, though, I just want to take us back for a little second and I want to think about what happened, what actually prompted all of the past 18 months and the best question I've come up with so far and I love hearing from people, it won't be possible uh, today but for any of you who come up with good answers I encourage you to ask other people in your school about this. The question I keep asking people is when did you realise the world was going to change? When was the moment that you thought to yourself, this isn't just happening somewhere else, this isn't happening in China and Italy, this is gonna happen here and our life is going to change. Over time, I've asked hundreds of head teachers, senior leaders and classroom teachers this question. For some of them, it's about their partners. Maybe they did a job in the police or in the health service and they got more of a head up early on. For very many people, they talk about the day when they had to actually close the school gates and not let most children back. And I remember one head talking about the fact that he stood on a gate and a kid called Charlie, who had really been struggling to come to school, you know, didn't want to come in. He was having loads and loads of issues. And finally, he just got to the point where Charlie wanted to come in. And he stood on the gate that day and the kid was walking out and he said, bye, sir. See you on Monday. He said, no, 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 Charlie, school's not going to be open on Monday. And Charlie turned and he said, but, but so why? I want to come to school. 
and he obviously explained to him and he said as he watched him walk away that was one of those moments where despite being the head despite being on the gate he got teared up and he just really really struggled with it and it's so hard to go through that as a sector the thing that all schools do is we tell children we will be here for you and we will make things regular at 10 past nine on a Monday, this thing will happen. And at three o'clock on a Tuesday, this thing will happen. And it doesn't matter. Everything else in the world can be falling apart. When you come here, we're going to ensure that you learn. And it was so difficult in those moments to have to pull that away. And the only experience I've got that's even vaguely similar is on the uh, day when the statement was coming from Gavin Williamson, I was asked by the BBC to listen into the statements in a van that looked like this. So this is a news van. It looks a bit like something from Ghostbusters, but it is a news van. You climb inside, there are screens everywhere, and you're able to, uh, to kind of talk about what's happening, and they beam it out to the TV or they beam it out to the radio. And in my case, it was going to be the PM show, which is a big drive time show on Radio 4. I got inside on the four cameras, this was playing. Number one, they were trialing the Chris Whitty advert. Some of you may remember this. It looks sort of like a disaster movie. And then there was Gavin Williamson. He was in Parliament giving his statements. Nicola Sturgeon was in Scotland giving her statement. And simultaneously, and oddly that day, Boris Johnson also was giving his press conference. I think they were actually still trying to keep everything roughly in line, Parliament and uh, the press. And Gavin Williamson said, we're going to close schools on Friday for further notice. It will only be the children... Uh, of key workers and vulnerable children coming into school and I sort of held it together and then he said and GCSEs and A-levels are cancelled and for me that was the moment because that was months off months and months off so if they were closing that then it meant we were all about to be thrown into something pretty horrendous and I started to shake and I, I thought I, I don't know I was going white I could feel like all the blood draining from me and the guy next to me asked, was I OK? And I said, yes. And then the next thing you know, I heard was a voice in my ear. And this little voice goes, OK, Laura, just passing you over to the uh, programme now. It's Evan Davis. He's the next voice that you'll hear. So I sort of breathed in. Up comes Evan Davis. And he says, Laura, what will school look like on Monday? And all I could think to say was, well, Evan, I think it's going to look a bit like a snow day. I, uh, yeah, I think I'm probably uh, on a snow day. Some children come in, some don't. Uh, some, some teachers come in, some don't. And maybe you sort of do a bit of PE and a bit of citizenship and uh, you sort of try and get it on, on track. But, you know, we've never been here before, so I don't know. And um, we'll, I guess we'll have to see on Monday. That was it. About a million people were listening. And that was about as good as I can get was a snow day. And I'm mortified when I look back. But actually... How else was we supposed to answer? This is what head teachers, teachers, senior leaders have been doing across the country for the past year. People ask you questions that you can't possibly know the answer to. You're supposed to pull it together, sound compelling and authoritative, knowing all the while that tomorrow things could change again. So it's just been, I mean, an extraordinarily challenging year an incredibly difficult position to be put in standing there crying as the Charlies leave not knowing the answers that is where we were in March last year and at that point we started asking some questions about what was going on we started to look and we started to share now some of the conclusions about what happened in that time period are quite strange in fact, last month, Robert Peston took to Twitter to say that teachers did not very much teaching in lockdown. And he was, I think, specifically referring to lockdown one. And I understand where he was coming from to an extent. We were tracking teacher working hours. And this was an important metric at the time because the ONS, the Office for National Statistics, looks at educational productivity, economic productivity, and it often uses the amount of hours that teachers are working to calculate what's going on economically. And that's why Robert Peston knows about these figures because they are to do with the economics of the country. And if you look at the end of March last year, or the beginning of April last year, those green boxes show you teachers who say that they were working many fewer hours 
or slightly fewer hours. You can see the majority of teachers were working fewer hours. It is worth remembering this was supposed to be the Easter holidays for many, many people. There were also many schools that were completely closed due to cover issues, bubbles bursting, perhaps they were entirely full of vulnerable communities and weren't able to stay open. Furthermore, we know that in the week when schools closed, only around a third of primary schools had an online platform. And just because they had an online platform, it doesn't mean everybody had passwords or everybody had devices or everybody knew how to use it. Secondary schools were in a slightly better position. Actually, the majority of them, over about 65%, had an online platform. But again, didn't mean that everybody knew how to use it. We also know that in those first few weeks, if you were in a low income community, so your school is in an area where there's lots and lots of children on free school meals, around 50% of you were sending paper booklets home, including writing materials, including literal textbooks, including exercise books, because you couldn't rely on the fact that children had devices. So yes, at the very beginning, teachers worked shorter hours. However, we also know that that corrected pretty quickly. In fact, by the time we got to the autumn, teachers were working so many hours, it broke the statistics. We had a problem where teachers had to now teach in school. This was in September, October, November, December, but also make sure that children at home were catered for. So suddenly you had quantum teachers. You had teachers who were teaching in a classroom, then running out, recording a video, doing a video chat, maybe hybrid teaching a set of classes at home at the same time. Suddenly the hours of teaching were massive, much bigger than they were before, to the point that it actually broke the calculation. Our economic productivity would have, wouldn't have worked anymore. And so the whole thing had to be recalculated based on how many children were actually accessing the materials and what learning hours they were doing compared to ordinary times. And you can see this in some of the data, whereby this lockdown, this January, actually the majority of teachers are working slightly more hours or many more hours than they were doing in normal circumstances. And even by um, June last year, when we had primary schools back, you could see it starting to taper off. So it's not true that people were doing uh, not very much teaching, what they were doing is fewer extracurricular activities, fewer parents' evenings. They were instead trying to deliver lunches, trying to deliver laptops, trying to deliver other bits and pieces. It was an incredibly difficult time, but it didn't involve quite as much teaching at the beginning. And then very quickly that got corrected. So it's been a weird year and it's been weird in another way as well. Anxiety. This has been one of the most interesting pieces of data that we've collected over the 18 months periods, I think it's important for absolutely everybody in education to see this graph. So you might have already seen me talk about it before, but I have some new data, new data that nobody has so far seen. It's data that looks at work related anxiety. Now, back in 2019 at TeachTap, we made the decision that we would be asking about very high work-related anxiety. So we'd be asking about work-related anxiety. Every Tuesday, pretty much, we would ask about work-related anxiety. We picked Tuesdays for no particular reason other than they were the middle of the week. And if we always asked on a Tuesday, then we were probably getting a sense of change over the year. If you have a terrible class every Tuesday, then you always have them on a Tuesday. We weren't gonna suddenly get changes and variations in the data. We started asking, in October 2019, and there are four lines, if you can see them, it's worth zooming in or making sure you can see this graph really clearly. The line to keep your eye on is the dark purple line. The dark purple line is head teachers. The other important line for now is the dark green line, and the dark green line is classroom teachers. In an ordinary week, in an ordinary time, which October 2019 to January 2020 was, you can see that roughly head teachers are up some week, classroom teachers are up some weeks, but roughly work-related anxiety is only high for about 14 to about 12 to 14% of teachers and head teachers. Now this graph is gonna run all the way through now to January, 2021. And uh, if we were in an audience, I would be getting you to put bets on when you think the most stressful month was. So maybe think to yourself now, which month do you think was the most stressful? I'm gonna reveal the first stress point. 
just before lockdown last year, everything shot up. It was hard to be in a school this time in March last year. Cover was difficult. People were trying to work out what you should do about pregnant staff, have bubbles bursting. It wasn't clear what was going to happen. And up until the lockdown, we had 38% of head teachers putting in high levels of work-related anxiety. It's about three times higher than it normally is. So much, much higher. And this is a group of head teachers, but when we ask them lots of other questions, they're pretty robust. They like their job, they wanna stay in it forever. They have long, long working hours, but they like their working hours typically more than other people in teaching. So they're a fairly hardy crowd. And for them to shoot up to 38%, that was huge. It hadn't been seen anything like this up until this point. It then dropped. And over the next few months, the summer period last year, you can see that it goes back up again for the June reopening and then starts to come back down. But also look at the dark green line. For teachers last year, that summer period, even with the gradual increase in working hours, the anxiety stayed reasonably low. Well, why is that? The things that stress out classroom teachers from what we can see across our data or around the actual classroom management, behavior management, and extra time pressures in school. The fact you're trying to do break duty, as well as do an extracurricular club after school, as well as trying to get parents evening in, as well as look out for an NQT who's down the corridor who's crying, as well as trying to make sure that kids have got, you know, bits of uniform they've left in your classroom and everything else. The stress has come from the actual classroom environment, and that got stripped away. When everyone was at home last year, as difficult as it was, it it's easier typically to be able to manage your own time yourself in your own environment compared to being in a school. For heads, however, it shot up and it really hasn't properly ever come back down again, except in half terms. And that's because for heads, they were dealing with those snow day questions constantly, people asking them what was going to happen next, and they didn't know. They weren't being give, given guidance that was clear enough to be able to get back to a level of certainty and control, which helps if you're a school leader. We then get into the autumn and you can see that, um, it's over. you can see that things start to get worse again. It's actually that little bit harder now to be a classroom teacher when you've got to have people in school, people out of school, wearing masks, dealing with bubbles and for the heads it starts going up and it starts going up until we hit January. And now you can see, hmm, there it is. Now you can see why I couldn't show you the key at the beginning. It actually gets so high that it broke the graph. By the time we got to January and the decision to close primary schools very late and secondary schools being told that they were going to have to do loads and loads of testing, we have 54% of head teachers registering very high work related levels of anxiety and 30% of classroom teachers doing the same. Now that is extraordinary. It is going to have implications long-term, undoubtedly. Of course, it's not everybody. There are half of head teachers who are not in this group, but we are talking about you know, nearly a five-fold increase here. It's a four-fold increase in the number of people who are dealing with very, very high work-related levels of anxiety. And it's tiring, it's exhausting, it's chronic. You can see it's happening across the year. And although heads have historically on TeachTap repeatedly told us since 2017 that they were the people most likely to stay in their jobs, they're the ones that we've started to see now saying, actually they think they might want to move away, actually they might want to leave earlier than they were expecting. Just before I move on, one thing to look at on this, check out the light purple line. That's the senior leaders excluding head teachers. Very unusually, their pattern follows classroom teachers and middle leaders much more than head teachers. And that's because so much has fallen on head teachers as the decision makers to keep everything together. But it does also mean that in terms of how exhausted everybody is, there may be, not for all of you, but for some of you, slightly more capacity within senior leadership within a school rather than within head teachers at the moment. And so over the next 12 months, the schools start to think about how they're going to get back, hopefully, to some level of normality. 
we're not seeing senior leaders saying they want to leave. We're seeing lots of senior leaders actually say they still want to step up and become head teachers in the future, or at least the same number as before. And if you're a senior leader and you are looking for more responsibility or you are looking to take on more projects, or you think this might be a moment for you to maybe do some comments or step up, this might be a good time to speak up because I do think that heads are going to have to use more capacity in the system rather than trying to do everything themselves. I say all this, but something different has happened since January. In secondary schools in particular, we have seen the tyranny of the tags. In fact, the schools have had to put together teacher assessed grades. So we have been keeping an eye on tags. There's some stuff in our blog last week looking at um, what's happened with tags and how people feel about them. So I encourage you to go to the teachtap.co.uk website and take a look at that if you're interested in tags. But we have today put together a new graph looking at the anxiety data from January. And um, I just sh should be able to move forward. This is what we are starting to see. We are seeing that head teachers, again, have stayed high and are creeping upwards, but also in April, May and June, you'll see that that very light green line, just looking to the right of the screen in the last few months, the light green line has started to creep back upwards and it's gone above the senior leaders and it's actually gone above the classroom teachers and that's because a huge amount of the pressure of tags has sat on the middle leaders now this takes into account secondary and primary my hunch is if we were to strip out just secondary that middle leader uh that middle leader line goes up even even higher so at the moment middle leaders you do need a bit of a rest within secondary schools slt i think still you may have to be the people here who, uh, who have just the tiniest bit more capacity to try and take on some of the responsibilities to get through this last five, six or seven weeks because it is absolutely exhausting and really challenging. Ultimately, this whole thing is not a sprint. It hasn't been for some time. Unfortunately, it's a marathon of indeterminate length in which we are already thinking it has gone on too long and surely the end is soon. But the schools that are doing this best are allowing people to keep running, running with their backpacks, but every now and then take a stop, maybe take someone else's backpack for a bit and then let them take yours. Because dealing with that level of anxiety chronically over such a long period of time is going to have long-term implications for the sector, undoubtedly. And it's really important that we pay a little bit of attention to it and share some of the responsibilities around. Leaving to the side then, we've done work hours, we've looked at anxiety. A couple more things to look at. Number one is just very, very quickly the important tale of face masks, only because it works as a nice parable of how change happens in schools. And it's one really to think about if you ever feel that you want to change a policy in schools in the future. Back in March last year, it's fascinating, we didn't even ask about face masks, it just wasn't even a thing. We asked, it was parents evenings in the week before lockdown, and we asked about hand sanitizers uh, and no handshake rules, which by the way, most schools didn't have even the week before lockdown. People think they did, when we asked in November if you had them, lots of teachers said their schools did. Actually, when we'd asked in the week of the lockdown, most schools didn't. Um, so there's not even any data on face masks, we forget how lax we were and for how long. April, still no data. In fact, the first time we asked about face masks was in May 2020. And at that time, 80% of teachers were against the idea of face masks in classrooms. They felt that the risks of having them, uh, of having students and teachers wear them really outweighed the benefits substantially. By September, that had flipped. We saw 60% of people thinking that they were beneficial. And by January this year, actually it had flipped again. So 80% for 80% uh, were in favour of face masks. And funnily enough, although it was never mandatory um, in primary schools for students to be wearing them in their classrooms, primary teachers were quite in favour. The people who were the least happy were primary heads, probably because they'd have had to deal with the parents more often. But actually, um, most teachers, and particularly in secondary, were very much up for wearing face masks. Now, I know Things have changed again. There's a policy has peeled away. People have stopped wearing them. And we've got different patterns in the country now. We can see that the Northwest have a lot more face mask wearing than, for example, the Southwest. But then there have also been more outbreaks in the Northwest than the Southwest. Um, but the reason it's such an interesting story and the reason to share this data is because it also shows us that teachers are willing to change their mind on policy points if two things happen. Number one, 
they were presented with evidence. Over and over and over again, we were presented with new evidence, which showed the different ways that um, the virus was being spread and that masks might be an effective way, or at least you know, not a harmful way of, of helping stop the spread of it. And the second thing is that the government actually did go slowly, step by step with this. So at first they started to encourage people to do things. Then they said, if you were in certain areas with outbreaks, then they put them in corridors, then they put them in classrooms. And by gradually just nudging people, they were able to change something that the profession were 80% against in one month to 80% of people being four in less than a year. Now, obviously you can't do that with every policy, but it goes to show that change is possible. When people think that because everybody is against something in education, it doesn't mean necessarily that they'll always be against it. This isn't a profession of people who are just stuck in the mud for no reason or have shown no ability to change. Profession has shown remarkable ability to adapt and remarkable ability to engage with really difficult issues. There is simply no one who wants to be in the position of teaching with a mask on. It makes life so much more difficult. And yet the profession were supportive once they were given more evidence, once they were able to try things, and ultimately once they felt that it was the right thing to do. Final bits then of data that are useful to have learned from this pandemic. There are three teacher trends which going into next year I think are important and will, will be worth knowing as you're mulling maybe in the summer about what next year will look like. One of these is the fact that over 50% of teachers have told us that this year they're not allowed to socialise in the staff room, either because the staff room has been taken over for extra space or due to social distancing. We also know that the question that is most predictive of whether or not people stay in their jobs, and this is from Gallup polls done across millions and millions of people, is whether or not you have a best friend at work. And it has to be that phrase, best friend at work. So there's a bit of an issue here where if you don't have uh, ability to socialise at work, are you likely to have a best friend? If you've been in a school for a long time, it's possible. Maybe you're WhatsApping each other, maybe you're doing video calls, maybe it's all fine. But if you've been a reasonably new teacher and you've worked in a school where you've been confined to eating in a room with kids, maybe having your tea breaks in, in rooms with children, which I know many primary schools have laid on sort of tea ladies to come around and bring you tea, which is great for keeping everybody warm with the windows open, but has been really quite difficult when it comes to socialisation. There is a risk that particularly for new teachers, either are new to a school or new to the profession, that they haven't been able to develop good friendships and relationships. And that really sustains us in the profession as we go forward. So schools need to think about whether or not there is an opportunity or an ability to build in slightly more socialising for staff, especially next year, if things get back to normal. Second interesting area is around homework. When we ask teachers which parts of their, their work is going to change the most in the future, um, they don't tend to talk so much about in-lesson changes because technology doesn't necessarily help with that so much, unless everybody's now got one-to-one -one devices, which I doubt. Um, but one of the areas where they do see a huge amount of expected change is in homework. Having had a taste of automation, of being able to use online subscriptions, of being able to have automated marking, of using voice notes, of Teams, of classrooms, of all different online platforms, many teachers feel that this has helped them the most with their workload, that it's easier to organise, and that also the children are able to sort of engage better with the work they can chat to their friends they can find out ideas and also parents might be able to more easily log in see what's going on rather than floaty bits of piece of paper i don't know as much whether senior leaders agree with this we've been asking the classroom teachers and it may require schools to invest in more technology long term but it feels like a bit of a watershed moment where if there are to be workload gains from tech Homework is probably one of the biggest areas. And if those can be consolidated and kept, it means that as we all get back to looking back at lesson plans for broad and balanced curriculum and getting back to running the nativity play, that could be an area that's really helped and would reduce workload. Speaking of which, coming back to flexible working. For years at Education Festival, I've talked about flexible working. It is a thing that persistently our uh, teach tap sample tell us they would like to be able to do a bit they would like to be able to in an ideal world work four day weeks but we've also seen people who say they would like 
to teach remotely some of the week. I mean, this was when everyone was hating remote teaching, was anxiety was through the roof, it was really challenging. And we still saw around a third of people saying they would like to teach remotely some of the week. About 10% of you would like to teach remotely all the time, which is, um, I don't know, I think a surprise for the others who really don't love it, but there is a small core of you who do. But the bigger thing is around flexibility. PPA at home, being able to come in maybe a little bit later one day a week. These are important things to teachers because it helps them with their work-life balance. Now, I've spent years saying this is impossible for schools. They simply can't do it. It's, it's just too hard. On the other hand, I also think schools are going to have to be careful. Although our sector is largely going to go back to in-person, schools will run as schools, everybody will be back again. That's not going to be the same for every industry. Many, many offices are changing the way that they're working. And that means that jobs that were previously confined to big cities will be available across the country. And suddenly, if you're a maths teacher and actually two days a week, you could do a part time job as a data analyst that's incredibly well paid and was previously only possible as a full time job in the city. We are going to see teachers who think to themselves, do I want to carry on teaching five days a week or actually if I can get a really well paid job now and I can be at home, would I prefer to do that? And they're not going to have to move house to do it and they can probably get really good salaries because these salaries were only previously for people who went to offices, but now they're going to be available absolutely anywhere. And as schools start to think about that market and what that actually means, it is possible we're going to have to think about whether more flexibility is possible whether it is, you know, that PPE could be done at home or even whether there are experiments that can be done with the kind of hybrid teaching that we saw previously. Can videos be provided? Could that mean that everybody goes and does, I don't know, their inset days together, but kids are still getting videos at home? There's a whole bunch of things that we're going to have to grapple with, probably not quickly. So the next couple of years, I think there won't be a teacher shortage. There's going to be enough people around. But gradually, as changes in other sectors mean that jobs are easier for people to do from home and they pay well from home, that is something for schools, especially in more rural areas, where they've been able to rely perhaps on people in the local community having to do jobs nearby, that we're going to see there's going to be more of a challenge. So it's worth keeping an eye not just on what's happening in education, but what's on happening everywhere else, because teachers are very, very eligible. They can do a lot of things. And if you're an English teacher and you now want to work in marketing, it's going to be a lot easier to be able to find those jobs than perhaps it was beforehand. I have, I've used this uh, slide a few times at festivals, that's why I've stuck it in. We do need to remember though, if 40% of teachers drop one day a week, we would need an extra 40,000 teachers, which is essentially two years worth of training teachers extra on top of the ones that we would normally have. So we're going to have to find a way to keep as many of the teachers as we possibly can. It's just going to be a real, real challenge. So it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, not just the virus, but all of the changes that are coming into society after this. It's a marathon, therefore, of indeterminate length. Even as we get back to normal, some other things are going to have changed forever. And although we are thinking it has gone on too long and surely the end is soon, we can't know. In fact, it may just be that there is no end to this. This is life. We have to keep going. We have to find ways to make it sustainable. And sometimes that's going to mean taking a rest. If there's one thing I can ask people to do, it's really have that rest when they get into, um, into the summer. I think they're going to need a really, really good rest. And I know some of you as heads have asked, uh, or your head teachers have told you, just have two weeks off. Don't even think about school. We're not even going to open. I think that's probably going to be a smart idea. And whatever else happens, however hard it's been, and however much you think to yourself, blimey, this is difficult, as long as you say something smarter than snow day when asked difficult questions or are making decisions, you're going to be doing better than I did in front of a million people. So well done for getting through the past year. Um, I don't think I could have done it. And uh, it's been just impressive to be able to be out on the media, taking the phone calls often from parents, especially in the second lockdown, and hear how many of them are grateful for the things that have happened in schools and how much schools really pulled out of the bag. To be up against it in that first lockdown with less than a third of primary schools having online platforms to move to a situation that we had by October 
where in a pandemic, children who were at home were having the same education as kids that are in school is absolutely extraordinary. And I'm very happy to tell Robert Peston any time that he thinks that it's not. Thanks very much. Laura, thank you so much for that. Really um, interesting uh, and insightful presentation and great to see some, some new data as well, particularly on the anxiety things, but I'll, which I'll come to in a moment. But the first sort of question I wanted to ask you is that I've seen you deliver a couple of times now a, a talk way back when we could meet physically for conferences around looking at the policy landscape over the next decade and what we should be aware of. Now we've experienced this pandemic for 18 months, what should we be looking out for over the coming few years in terms of policy developments? So I think there's probably the early career framework is a massive driving force at the moment. Um, it's, you know, it is a revolution in the way that we're thinking about teachers careers. So it's no longer the case that you're a newly qualified teacher and then you get kind of like half an hour every week to think about your practice. The, the, the department, I think the government, I think everybody in teaching school alliances, everybody is trying to look at how do you get teachers in the door on day one and then make them want to stay and build them and build their confidence, their skills, their leadership right through 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, because A, that's how we get really good people in and staying in. It's also how we make sure everyone's got the right skills. You know, it's really difficult. If you suddenly become a head teacher and nobody's taught you about finance or um, safeguarding other bits and pieces, you know, that, that shouldn't happen. So I think the early career framework is going to drive a lot. And that's the really positive side. Um, we've also saw last week, Gavin Williamson at the Education Festival said that if you wanted to know which speech to look at, which was going to drive his future, it was the one from the Confederation of Schools Trust. And that's all about academization. And it talks specifically about 100% of schools becoming academies. And I know that's controversial. I know not everybody likes it. I know from Teach Chat that people have a lot of concerns about academy, Matt, CEO, pay. But if you put those two things together, kind of a, a framework for teachers to do lots of different jobs in lots of different places and schools coming together into families whether that's a small family of three or these huge chains of sort of 60 schools it does mean that we would be able to share resources around the system better and I think that's what's going to drive the next 10 years which is exciting and also scary because we don't know how it will go. Definitely. Um, one, one of the things we saw last summer was that a lot of um, teachers stay put in, in their current schools. Obviously, the last thing they were thinking of is probably moving jobs midway through a pandemic. Um, now we're sort of coming out of the pandemic. What are, pe what are teachers saying at the moment? Are they looking to stay put for this academic year? And, and will we therefore see a huge boom next year in terms of the number of vacancies around? Yeah, we did a, a, a piece of work last year on this and we will be bringing that out again. So I've not got the current results at the moment. They're all still in the, in the sort of teach tap towers being calculated. Um, I think you're right that we've probably seen over the last 18 months less movement than normal. Um, and But I don't know, my, my hunch is that it'll probably start to go back more to normal. Um, if we stay in an economic bit of a dip, you know, our unemployment rates are higher than they were, then that's always easier for education. We also are going to start to have more people coming out of university again in the next few years as the pupil numbers tick up. This was a sort of historic low. But we've also got implications of immigration, which we don't know. And I think this flexible working thing it only clocked on to me the other day because I speak often to head teachers in areas especially in the north where I'm from as well where the salaries of jobs are not the same as they are in other parts of the country and so if you're a teacher it's often a case of well I look around I've done 10 years I'm thinking of going but what else would I do that pays as well if I'm an English teacher and I can now get a marketing job on 50 grand um, then then it might be more challenging to try and keep people and if if the whole sort of our work life in other sectors, if our partner is working from home and actually we see that they like it and we want to try it, that may be more possible. And so we're gonna to have to work out actually what is the sell. And hopefully the sell is being around kids and being in school and it's brilliant, but it may have to be more sophisticated. Have, have we seen a change in, in people's attitudes in terms of their uh, affection towards their, their current employers and, and their, their colleagues? You know, one reason to move on is, is to move away from your current school. You may not get on with the management or wider team has the pandemic brought teams closer together in some regards and, and that's a, an incentive to remain where they are uh, there's definitely been a huge amount of pride so whenever we ask questions about are you pleased with are you proud of what your school did in the pandemic the vast majority of people are, are, are very very proud of what their school communities achieved and rightly so the difficulty is how long does that last right so in two years time if i'm dreading school on a sunday night do i care that two years ago i'm very proud of what we did in a pandemic 
And I, that's why I think this isn't an immediate problem. I think for a couple of years, people are probably very like they've gone through something very interesting often and um, they feel really bonded where their school has worked well. If they've been in a school where they've not felt that relationship, then they may be more likely to leave. But certainly there's been lots and lots of that bonding feeling. For now, I just don't have any reason to believe that that would last a very long time. The anxiety statistics you showed earlier were, were, were frankly quite shocking, particularly when it came to, to senior leaders. Have you got any data looking specifically at what senior leaders are saying about their future? You know, these are individuals that have been through an incredibly challenging time and now have huge you know, institutional knowledge, uh, you know, and probably need, they need to captain and steady their ship for a long time. But, you know, have, have they got the, the drive and, and the want to, to, to stay put longer term now? Or are they all looking at flying the nest, so to speak? Not all. I mean, heads, heads, I think I said before, I often used to do a talk, probably did it at a festival before now, where I'm often a bit mean to head teachers. And I'll say, you know, you kind of, you do work really long hours, but you also have the best work-life balance, the best autonomy. You want to stay in your job the longest because it turns out that the great thing about being a head is anything you don't like to do, you can usually delegate. <laughs> um, and then head teachers all laugh and great. That's not been the experience of the last year. Um, yeah. Nevertheless, most people are I mean, heads are particularly proud of what their schools have achieved. They really feel like they've done a good job and most of them have done extraordinarily well. But we have seen an increase of about a third, about 30 percent more people saying that they would be thinking of leaving sooner than they would have done in previous years. Um, That's quite a substantial increase. We haven't seen senior leaders who are not heads say that they want to be head teachers at any less of a level. So I'm interested that what you've got is a group who are normally incredibly robust who have gone through a really difficult period and for now at least are saying they feel like they'd be more likely to leave. And I've always thought it would be really hard to do anything to make that group feel that way. Doesn't mean they will, doesn't mean it's all of them, but it's more than I would have expected, which I think goes to how difficult it has been. What's I mean, interesting is it hasn't put the senior leaders off wanting to be heads. Well, they must, I guess a lot must have the attitude today of, you know, things can only get better. <laughs> it, can't, it can't be any worse than what we've just experienced. Right. And I would hope that. And I actually hope that for the profession generally. Right. Like after this, I hope it feels like teaching on the easy setting. I mean, you know, you'll be able to use your face. You'll you'll be able to like be nearer to children, just physical proximity. Like there are some small things here that actually have a huge impact on what it's like to be in a classroom. And if you've got through 18 months of not being able to do those things once they come back, hopefully it will feel a lot. It will feel a lot easier. What I don't think we should discount, though, is how soon these things catch up with you and how often when people have been through a big big stressful period in their life they do get physical illnesses or actually they do slow down very quickly or actually when it all stops life feels too slow and suddenly that's hard cognitively to deal with and and it it feels very very depressing so I sort of worry about that more than I worry about people going right that was too difficult I'm off yeah I, I, yeah, I have to agree. As a business leader myself, you know, those first few months of the pandemic, whilst they were terrible, they were some of the most interesting, exciting periods, you know, in 10 years of being a managing director, um, because you you were firefighting all day, you were, you were being a, you had to be a very proactive and active leader. Um, so yeah, I, I can see, what, let's hope, you know, the nation doesn't have a huge bout of PTSD, I guess, collectively, but we'll have to wait and see on that one. One of the things we're seeing as well, that you know, there's this huge influx in the number of people wanting to become teachers. Now, mm. as somebody on the outside that's not a teacher myself, it's not what I've seen over the past 18 months and how, you know, the workload of teachers, but also to, to some extent how teachers haven't been valued by those in positions of power all of the time. It's not necessarily a job I've, I, that's appealed to me. What, why are people wanting to suddenly become a, a, a teacher? A, it's just a brilliant job, right? So, and I say this is somebody who did go and become a teacher and, and did think it's great. And I think it either appeals to you or you don't as well. I also appreciate like not everyone is going to look at it and think, you know, wow, I want into something, as you say, that looks from the outside sometimes undervalued. The awesome thing when you're in there is you are massively valued by the pupils usually and valued by the parents and the community. It can feel sometimes <laughs> on day to day like that's not always the case, but in your heart of hearts, I think you know it. And often in an economic recession people turn to teaching because it feels stable and it feels like well I'll get my qualification I'll always have a job at least I know what it is it's a job I've seen before and and there is a worry sometimes that because of that you get lots of people in who are not right and they'll leave again in a few years and I I get that worry 
I also know that I was someone who did that myself and probably thought I'd only last about 18 months and I got in and I absolutely loved it and had it not been for the events of being taken to court probably would have stayed in it and so I also think we maybe don't need to worry so much about why they came in and we maybe don't even need to worry so much about whether it looks valuable from the outside just get them in any way you can and once you're in there make sure they have a really great experience and that's what the early career framework does and that's what you know I went to Stratford School Academy and I have to say that the people who mentored me coached me my tutors and from I did teach first like they were the people who made me want to stay along with the children and if we get that bit right then it doesn't matter why they came in I think they'll they'll stay because it's it's so great and addressing this whole flexible working um, shagans, you know, if, if, if employers or schools from the offset can can offer a type of solution, you think that would be very helpful? I don't know, I'm just so torn on it because if like if we do that, so let's say we say to everybody you can work flexibly from now on and then we lose 40,000 teachers because everybody goes to four days a week. How do we cope with it? But I'm just at a point as well where I'm like, OK, but if I used to not think that or I used to get the challenge, if we don't do that, we lose more people. I used to think that's not true. Our data pretty much suggests that in lots of parts of the country, there just aren't other jobs for people to walk into that are good substitutes. I think we now live in a world where that's a different calculation. And so I, I don't know how schools do flexible working. I think it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess that's one of the reasons why I'm talking about it and saying, even though I've said for years, just ignore it. I was probably wrong. And if someone can come up with better solutions, let's try them, because otherwise we're going to get caught out in about five years, I think. Yeah, we need to at least start having the conversation. and yeah, discuss. And, and also, maybe this is also a time really radical, crazy. No one is going to have this conversation. But, you know, are there parents who want their kids taught remotely one day a week because actually they could go to their caravan on a Friday morning and then be there with their kids for the weekend? Or are there people whose kids they want to see they, they work at the weekend and actually they'd like their kids to be out of school two days in the week, but they could do catch up on video on a weekend? Like, is there a is there enough flexibility in the system for parents and for children that might match some of the flexibility flexibility that that um, parents want and a final thing is probably really relevant is there are more private schools looking to expand their online only offering and if there is 10 percent of teachers who want to work remotely only does the state sector lose them to online private schools and if we do you know what happens then you can't lose 10 percent of state school kids to there as well because that has a knock-on impact for funding for state schools one of the things I was going to ask, actually, you, your organisation also has a, a second app, a, a, a sister app to Teach Tab, which is Parenting, yeah. uh, obviously for parents. And I'm just wondering if you have any intel data from, from you know, what are parents' views around the, the future of the classroom? Is, you know, this the whole flexible learning opportunity, is it something that parents have provided any opinions to you yet on? You know, interestingly, it's a bit like the masks, I suppose. We haven't even... Like we haven't really asked around that. A lot of what we asked around was to do with the lockdown learning. And I think that the experience of most parents of that lockdown learning was so difficult. Um, it, there were some who, who flourished, but for a lot of people, it was really challenging and it became more challenging as time went on. So any romanticism about the idea of having your children at home, there is a small group of people who have felt that, but I, I can't say that our data has said that it's very big. Um, and to that extent, then I, I don't I don't know, but it's a good it's a good challenge and we should possibly offer different futures for people so that they would be able to pick from them. I don't think it's a huge pursuit. I don't think it's massive. I think at least 90 percent of people stay with what they've got. It's just that even a five or a 10 percent shift of these things has huge implications for the numbers. Yeah. And so we have to keep our eye on those margins. One quick question um, before we, we have to wrap up running out of time quickly, but uh, one thing I was interested to know about is, is whether you have any data or intelligence around what pupils' concentration and engagement with their learning has been like since they've returned to the classroom, in, in most instances anyway. Yeah, from what we can see, we haven't been able to pick up any differences. So we had a variety of different behaviours in classes that we would sometimes ask teachers before the pandemic and after, like, did any of these happen in your class today? People being late, not sort of paying attention. We really haven't picked up great differences. And this goes to something I think I said earlier, which is it, it's, people find it really hard to remember. If you ask teachers how many hours they worked each day, and then a week later you ask them how much they worked in the week, 
their calculations are different by about, by quite a big magnitude actually okay. um, they they overestimate so i think people felt that like their kids were less engaged but actually that that appears to have been to just to do with how much more difficult it is and also there have been a lot more safeguarding issues and so one or two children who are having a really really difficult time um can sometimes make it feel much much worse and i think definitely we've picked up and heard from people that those those pupils that were struggling before often struggling much more now but on a day-to-day basis not hearing uh, as much on the behavior side as, okay. uh, as other people have picked up two quick fire questions who's going to be the next sector of state for education oh blimey i don't I don't know. I always wanted James Brokenshire, um, but he's he's really stepped back since he's been in ill health. So I don't think he'll he'll um, be around. But if I could pick, I would probably have picked him. I thought he did some quite good work in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Um, and actually, Dominic Raab, I used to sort of not want Dominic Raab, but he, he did. He did talk once about this idea of letting Oxford have anyone sit the exams. And I'm quite up for that. Like if you could just pay for the exam and you can sit it and pass it, why can't you have an Oxford degree? So let's let's do Dominic Raab. Why not? All right, Dominic Rubb, and what's your favourite biscuit? Um, mine's a bourbon. How boring is that? I mean, if you want to go high end, a classic, please. But, you know, general biscuit tin, I want a bourbon. Laura McInerney, it's been lovely to have you here this evening. Thank you very much for your talk. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me, Shane. Thanks. Good evening, Festival, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. It's my great honour to welcome you all. It is a very prestigious award. It means the world to me. They have great senses of humour. I like to reveal parts of history to them before. I love making history come alive. They are some of the best people that you can come across. To help them open their hearts. I always come back to this quote. How can we be role models to learners if we're not learners ourselves? It's quite useful to get out of our bubbles, not our COVID ones, and sort of see what else is out there. By sharing best practice, we can see the whole picture. We can see what really matters. It's easy to forget how much has to happen behind the front lines. As a global schools group, Cognita educates over 55,000 students across 12 countries. We're proud to be wellbeing partner at this year's Festival of Education and we want to share the work that we're doing to prioritise children's well-being. This starts with a clear understanding of what well-being is. We looked at the evidence and created a simple Be Well Charter that everyone can use day to day. It gives a clear definition of well-being and then focuses on the specific contributors that influence it. Discover our full Be Well Charter video and other resources to use with your students and families at cognita.com. I really try to not look at myself as just a science teacher. I feel like as a teacher, it's, it's very important to help students grow and develop outside of your lessons. A single teacher believing in you and really believing in you. One teacher doing that can have a large impact, but if you have one or two or three all telling you that and really, really believing in it, it makes you feel like you can achieve anything in the world, honestly.